All right, welcome everyone to SQL Friday. This is, I think, number 84. Uh, and our guest today is Damir Matesic, who is uh, connecting from Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, Damir has been on SQL Friday a few times before. I'm really glad that you're back, Damir, uh, despite that you are quite busy organizing both SQL Saturday in Croatia and Data Weekender. So I also think that actually I was the first speaker. You were, Friday. that's true. You were number one. Yes. So, <laughs> and okay. we had quite a good turnout. But I mean, but since it was the first, uh, I think I posted about it on LinkedIn and Twitter for every day for a few weeks before. Uh, but there were more than 100 connecting to that one, I think. So we're a bit fewer today, but uh, it, it's recorded so people can see it afterwards. Although, yes, of course, of course, there is some added value to be on the actual call because we can ask you questions. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going to stop babbling and let you take over. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much. So welcome to new SQL Server functions, syntaxes, tips and tricks. Uh, this session what I already did present a few times ago and now has some uh, newly added stuff uh, from Azure databases. And uh, maybe next time when I will present this session, we will have something from SQL Server 2022. But we should still wait for the release of this version of uh, SQL Server. And uh, this session is something like a retrospective of some cool features introduced uh, through last uh, three versions of SQL Server. So you will find something also from 2016 and 17, 19, and so on. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I was for many years a developer and programming ASP.NET and using C Sharp. And I was using also many other uh, languages programming. <clears throat> but uh, in last 10 or maybe more years, I actually specialized myself to SQL Server and uh, development and something optimization and so on. Uh, I am working for a creation company called Spam, and actually uh, we have offices also in other countries, for example, in USA, UK, and etc. Also Ukraine. And uh, but now uh, a lot of employees from Ukraine. Uh, came to Croatia because of the situation. Uh, I'm also leading the Croatian SQL Server user group. Uh, I organize uh, data events in Croatia. I am also together with Magnus, one of uh, co-founders of Data Weekender conference. And when free, I am blogging about SQL Server. I'm also rewarded by Microsoft with the MVP status. OK, enough about me. Now let's talk about my car. I'm just kidding. OK, uh, so this session will be uh, a retrospective of some new features from 2016 up to date. And uh, there are actually many, many improvements from that version uh, up to date. But uh, I like to watch uh, to talk about some functions related to string manipulation and also some other segments. So this is not uh, strictly about performance tuning ex uh, enhancements, but <clears throat> uh, you will see some new features and functions and maybe if you are still using some old versions of SQL Server, uh, you will get 
some new nice hints why you should, for example, move to Azure or maybe to a new version of SQL Server on premises. OK, uh, so SQL Server 2016 about strings. First, introduced uh, split string or string split, actually. It's a table value function for uh, splitting strings by a separator. It has uh, multiple usages. For example, you can use it to like input value for a store procedure or whatever, whenever you need to split strings. Uh, it returns a single column table with parts or fragments, and the name of the column is value. Return type depends of any of the input arguments. So you have actually a table on the MSDN or how it's called recently. So for example, uh, nvarchar and nchar are returning nvarchar and all others return varchar. The table value function can be used not only in the select statement, but also in the where or from for example, in the join and cross apply. Uh, from my experience, I know that there are many theories and approaches and solutions to split strings in SQL Server before, of course, the existence of this function. And uh, I actually prefer the one with XML. And uh, you have actually great articles and comparisons of uh, various approaches to split strings in SQL Server. And one good was from Aaron Bertrand, but actually he changed the site, but I'm not sure where is the new article about that. OK, uh, string escape uh, is used for escaping special characters by escaping rule. Of course, you can use any escape rule while it is JSON. <laughs> so JSON is actually the only supported rule. Uh, why is that? Uh, the point of this is that actually SQL Server 2016 introduced also JSON support. So, uh, they needed actually a uh, function for escaping special characters for JSON documents. So this <coughs> function was born for that. Uh, I think that I actually, my first session was about JSON on SQL Friday. So if you would like to know a bit more about using uh, and manipulating JSON in SQL Server, just go and find the rec recording on the channel of SQL Friday. OK, uh, format message. So it is actually enhanced in SQL Server 2016 to accept the message string argument. Uh, it means that you can use your own string to build a message. And uh, if you are also a developer like me, or feels like a developer, maybe your dream was to be able to format and concatenate strings in SQL Server easily, like for example, in C Sharp uh, string format. So we could say actually that the format message can be used similar to string format in C sharp. And let's jump to the demos. OK, so string split. Uh, Magnus, is this readable? For me, it is, yes. No okay. problem. Nice. So we have actually ingredients of a mojito cocktail here. Uh, separated by comma, and I want to split this. Of course, I will get the ingredients, and that's uh, all the ingredients for a mojito cocktail. Uh, one downgrade, actually, is that uh, uh, we cannot, for example, use two characters like a separator. 
for example, I want to split values by this to and this is not possible in the string uh, split. And also one thing that you have in mind, you must have in mind is actually that the empty values are also represented in the result. So maybe you would like to add a where clause to eliminate these uh, results. OK, this is one usage example, for example, that uh, the warehouse stock items has uh, actually some in JSON, some st stock item names. And they actually here made uh, just small trick to get rid of this uh, JSON uh, characters and I actually split the values by uh, comma. Of course, this is not the best approach for this, but you can use it for that. And also, for example, if you would like to use uh, this function in like uh, input parameter for a stop procedure or something, you have this uh, example, for example, like variable and then you can use exist, for example, or in or whatever you like. OK, but uh, let's see actually. Uh, the. Performance of all of this, so this is actually the old approach of splitting strings by using XML. Uh, I, I I will not tell you that this is the best way to split strings before the split string function, but uh, I think that it was most used at least. So I will uh, compare the results of the old way and the new way of splitting strings. Just let's see if it is working. Of course, it's working. And let's turn on statistics, whatever, and let's run the two queries. So as you can see, the first query is with uh, old approach using custom function uh, with XML. And the second one is with string split. So the result is the same, or at least should be same. But let's see uh, some statistics. So the first query takes CPU time 16 milliseconds and elapsed 138 milliseconds. And the second one with the new function actually was finished almost instantly. Uh, also notice here that the first query was using some temp object and it had uh, 227 logical reads. And in the second query, you cannot find this uh, object. And if you look at the execution plan, you will see that the old approach take 64% of the whole batch and the second one 36%. So I would say actually that uh, the new functions is uh, pretty better than the old approach. Uh, and if you are uh, using it, in the on Azure databases currently, uh, you can also uh, specify an additional parameter if you want to get ordinal numbers. Actually, so you would actually know uh, which component of the split string was on uh, which position of the original uh, string. And it is uh, working for now only on Azure SQL. And we, of course, hope that it will be implemented in uh, next version of SQL Server, like, let's say, a standard. OK. String aggregate. So uh, this is for aggregation, but this is coming of course, after some slides, uh, I will not show you in the demo all of these uh, functions 
that I uh, present in the demo because uh, they are pretty straightforward. And uh, if somebody wants to check them, uh, I can send you mat materials uh, after. Okay, uh, let's go to SQL Server 2017. It introduced some uh, new functions like, for example, trim. So it's logical because before trim, I, I don't even know why Microsoft team took so many times to de develop this function. And before trim, you should use uh, L trim and R trim. So L trim removes from the left side spaces, empty characters, and the uh, trim from the right side. And now you have the trim that actually removes uh, space characters from both sides, meaning at the beginning and the end of the string. String aggregate. So it's also introduced in uh, 2017. It's pretty much the opposite of uh, string split that actually was developed in 2016. And also like uh, the string split, there are many theories and approaches how to split, uh, aggregate strings in SQL Server. There is also the one with XML and stuff. And I also think that this is the most commonly used way to do it. And uh, I will later in the demo show you the compartment of performance of these two uh, methods. Translate. So if you maybe was thinking like me, <laughs> that translate has something in common with language translations that you are, of course, completely wrong. And but if we are talking between us, I think that this would be actually cool to be able to translate something in SQL Server by using, for example, Bing Engine or whatever. Uh, the function translate replaces multiple characters inside the given string value. Uh, it cannot be used to replace a character with an empty string. And this was is actually only possible by using replace function. Okay, and concat vs uh, SQL Server function concat was introduced in SQL Server 2012. And simply as that, it returns a string that is the result of concatenating two or more string values. The new, 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 newly <coughs> introduced uh, function concatvs uh, concatenates a variable number of arguments with the delimiter specified in the first argument separator. So meaning that if you, for example, want to create a CSV file, separate multiple columns separated by comma, then you can use concat a VS function. So the first parameter is a comma, and then uh, after the first parameter, uh, you can uh, put as many of uh, columns or values that you want to be concatenated by the first character, meaning the first parameter. Okay, demo of string aggregate. Go to aggregate values, gene and tonic, and for the delimiter I was using space, and I get gene and tonic, of course. Uh, let's test it on a real database. So string aggregate, all the customer names, from sales customers. And actually I get here uh, exception. Uh, 
the reason for that is that if you look here, the customer name is nvarchar100. And SQL Server thinks that actually uh, it's impossible that this the result will be more than 800 bytes because uh, the initial value that we are concatenating is uh, only 100 characters. So if we want to concatenate uh, such in such case, we must first uh, make a cast. So we must convert the this column to nvarchar max, and then if we run this code again, you will see that we get the result. So no exception anymore. Uh, what will happen if we try to aggregate something that has uh, null values? Let's find it out. So null values will be ignored, and this is pretty cool for me, at least. Okay, and uh, one usage example is, for example, give me all inv invoice IDs grouped, let's say grouped by <coughs> customer ID, yes. And these are all the in, in uh, ID of all invoices for this customer in a row. But uh, here maybe uh, it can happen actually that these invoice list IDs are not uh, sorted out. So, Maybe you have a case that you need that this is sorted, for example, ascending or descending for any reasons. And the way to achieve this is that you actually can use this within group, order by, and ascending or descending order. So now when we run this query again, now it's pretty much we can be sure actually that the result is sorted out. Uh, change this to descending, so you will see actually that the numbers are falling down. Okay. And performance of this, let's see uh, the first part of the code that you can see here is by using XML and stuff. And I know that uh, it was, uh, let's say, mostly used or commonly used. And the uh, second one is with string aggregate. I will run these queries in parallel. Let's see execution plan. So the first one with XML and stuff, uh, SQL Server thinks actually that this was the 100% of the whole batch. So meaning that the second one is 0% of the whole batch. Okay, that's, that's not absolutely true, but let's see the statistics. So we have in the statistics, uh, first one, we had 78 milliseconds and totally 228 milliseconds. And for the second one with string aggregate, we had only 60 milliseconds of CPU time, and the lapsed time was 150 milliseconds. Uh, in logical reads, the second one has even something more than the first one, but uh, the statistics actually are much better for the string aggregate function. Okay. Uh, if maybe someone here wants to see uh, a demo about these functions that I only mentioned, like string escape or uh, format message or whatever, just tell me now so I can show you this. Otherwise, uh, we can go to the next topic. Seems like uh, 
there are no questions about the functions. Okay. I see uh, Gabrielle is writing something. Uh, translate. translate. Maybe. Okay. Translate. Here it is. So, okay. Let's uh, uh, run it somewhere. Okay. Okay, so what's actually the point? The point is that uh, I will try even better to write this code. Okay, so I will have here A's and here I have C's, or C vectors, and I want to replace every A with an F and every C with an H. Okay, let's run it. Mm. Okay, why it's not working? A with F. What? I'm, uh, I don't understand what's happening. Uh, let's go back. Okay, this is working, of course. So I'm replacing every close parenthesis with open one, and I get here from Smiley to set smiley. Okay. And of course, uh, when uh, you cannot use to replace uh, a character with an empty character. So you must always have a defined uh, starting character and the one you want to replace. Okay. So, for example, if you want to replace space with uh, full stop, then this should be used, of course. And uh, okay, the sec this example will show us, for example, that every this bracket, okay, so just okay, so every <coughs> This symbol is replaced with this symbol, and every symbol this is replaced with this symbol. Of course, that's the way to achieve this by using translate. And the same example of doing this by using the old uh, replace was uh, that actually you should call twice replace because was you were unable to replace uh, multiple characters at once so twice replace but uh, uh, okay maybe because uh, i have a typo here hmm. okay yes so every a character uh was replaced with an f and every c with an h so now now it's working of course uh i think that i uh, i take a script old script that i actually was uh, showing a demo how it's working with replace and translate so I actually accidentally saved uh, the replace and now I understand what happened. So uh, in short words, every first character is replaced with the first character here. The second character is replaced with the second character here. And if you, for example, have uh, actually a third character, it will be replaced by a third character here. And probably the result. Oof. Sorry. Uh, L trim, R trim. 
Okay. So you have uh, spaces at the beginning and spaces at the end of the string. And we want to get rid of all spaces, uh, leading and ending spaces. So the old approach is with L trim, R trim, because the L trim removes spaces at the beginning of the string. R trim removes uh, spaces at the end of the string. And this is from SQL Server 2016, replaced uh, by only trim. And the result will be the same. So here, st you started with spaces at the beginning and spaces at the end. And as a result, you get, uh, you don't have any more spaces at the beginning at, and, and the end. Uh, no, translate cannot uh, translate. Uh, good question. So Alexander is asking, is there options to replace one character by two or which versa? No, it's not possible. So translate only replace character by character. Uh, okay, uh, mate Farkas. So uh, tell that trim is not just a combination of L trim and R trim because it can remove any leading and closing character. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how do you think actually this because uh, trim cannot uh, trim only remove uh, spaces. And not a, any character. So, for example, if you okay, oh yes, you are right. I learned something new. Thank you. That was new for me too. Wow. Yes. Cool. Thank you, mate. Okay. Are there any other questions? Or maybe some somebody wants to learn us something new. It would be actually cool. The chat seems quiet for the moment. OK, let's continue. So maybe we can get back. OK. Uh, 2019. Uh, the nice error message string or binary data would be truncated. So before SQL Server 2019, you had this nice message. So string or binary data will be truncated. Thank you very much. And uh, you actually don't know uh, the location. Actually, what record uh, is guilty for this error message? And from SQL Server 2019, the error message is much cooler. So we will actually know the database name, the table name, the column name, and uh, the start of the truncated data. And it's uh, much easier actually to find uh, the string that caused your, your problems. Uh, notice, uh, notice actually, that uh, you you must have in mind actually that uh, the error number changed actually absent. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, so the error number changed from eight thousand one hundred fifty two to two thousand six hundred twenty eight. And for example, if you are using you are catching in your code and referring to error code uh, by error number, 
you can actually turn off this feature. It's equal to 2019 by writing this alter database scope configuration set verbose truncation warning to off. And if you run this uh, command, then you would get the old error number, meaning 8152. And you would uh, also don't not know uh, where is the issue and what record caused you problems. Okay, uh, before SQL Server 2019, storing some characters, for example, ASCII or similar was very limited. Not very limited, but somehow limited. I will explain myself. So SQL Server uh, supports Unicode characters in the form of nchar, nvarchar, and ntext data types that are using UTF-16 encoding. The penalty of this was that you need to pay the price for more storage and memory because you had to store all the data in the Unicode UTF-16, even when you, for example, needed only ASCII characters. Uh, UTF-8 is the dominant character encoding system for the whole World Wide Web and it is used in over 90% of all web pages. UTF-8 database support allow us application internalization without converting all strings to Unicode. UTF-8 support in SQL Server 2019 is implemented as new collations and you have in total 1,553 new collations that you can choose for your database. Uh, you can, of course, identify them because they finish with UTF-8 suffix. Okay, example of this is uh, we are actually trying to use some Cyrillic translation of the phrase SQL Server 2019 support UTF-8 collation. And if Google Translate doesn't lie to us, oh, sorry, Bing Translate, just kidding. Uh, it should be like visible here on the screen. And uh, on the left side, you have the non-UTF-8 database. And notice that the result for the query where we are using the virtual data type is incorrect. Uh, we lost the Cyrillic characters. The characters are displayed correctly only in the second query, the one with n virtual data type. Okay, on the right side, you have the database with collation that actually supports UTF-8. And the result is now correct in both cases. So you have them also in the varchar and also in the n varchar. And uh, if you look at the data length value, you can actually notice that there is a slight improvement in the consumption of the space needed for storing Cyrillic characters by using UTF-8 encoding. Uh, maybe it's not so much, it's something like 20% if I just calculated it well, but um, <clears throat> the storage is still, I think, the most slower component in databases. So maybe you should think about this to save some storage in your databases. Of course, if you are using some uh, non-English characters and maybe you are making some applications for international usage, etc. Okay, let's see. Uh, I would actually not jump now to the demo of this 
because I showed you the results. But let's discuss the next topic first, and then we will see a demo. So compress and decompress. SQL Server compressed and decompressed are introduced into SQL Server 2016. And as you probably know, SQL Server has already the support for a row and page compression of data. And compress function isn't the replacement for them. The function actually returns the data type of var binary max that represents the compressed continent of the input. The function uses a gzip algorithm for data compression. <coughs> compressed data cannot be indexed. So this is a downgrade, a big downgrade of this. And it is recommended to use it on rarely used data, maybe some log data or XML, because the data is not simple readable or usable if first not decompressed. On short text values, the compressed data could use more space than the original one. And this is a normal behavior like the file compression of a really small files. Uh, decompress. So maybe you are thinking that decompress should be the exact opposite of the compress mechanism, or maybe not. So uh, it's not simple. The function returns the data type of var binary max. So if you like to get the original value, you must first cast it in the original data type. And of course, you will use some CPU power for all of that. OK, uh, I have here a pretty big lorem ipsum string, and I will compress it. As you can see, I, here I get the uh, var binary, and this is the compressed value. So let's see actually the efficiency of this. So I started with the 1152 original size, compressed size is 435. And the compression rate is 62% of this. But if, for example, I am trying to compress a small string, I have the compression rate of minus 20%, meaning actually that the compressed size is bigger than the original size. And this is pretty normal. For example, you can try to compress an empty text file and the result will be bigger than the original one. Uh, I have here, uh, I think, prepared some uh, data for you, but I must only use the correct database. Now, let's see. So I have actually here, uh, Order lines, sales order lines from the database. And in the second exa uh, example, sales order line compressed, I have uh, compressed values of this order description field. And now let's see the compartment of uh, space used. So uh, the first one is the original one. And you have uh, 44 megabytes used for that. Uh, the second one is uh, row compression used. And as you can see, the row compression is using only 23 megabytes for the same records. And it's really similar to page compression that actually used 23 also megabytes or a little less than that. And uh, the last one is our compressed table, and it used uh, 32 megabytes, almost 33. Uh, so it's a little bit better than the original one, but it's not good as the page and row compression. Okay. But uh, I have also here some. XML data compressed. 
So as you can see here, uh, this is the original R XML documents, for example, some logging or whatever you have in your databases. Here are the compressed one. But now if we check the space use usage, you will actually see that the compressed is uh, almost the half size of the original one non compressed. But uh, of course, uh, it's not uh, so uh, it's not so fast because if you want, for example, to read these uh, compressed data, you must decompress them and you cannot index them and blah, blah, blah. So uh, you will use a lot of CPUs for this. So it's better to use the compress function uh, with early uh, used data. OK, uh, decompress. So OK, let's see some also funny examples of this. So of course, this is working like that. I have a string. I'm going to compress and decompress it. When I run this, I actually was thinking that I will get the original value, and that's not true because the result of the decompress is var binary max. OK, so to be able to get the original value, I must compress the compress and of course cast and uh, I must cast it in the original or starting data type. What will happen if we don't cast it in the original data type? It will happen fun. So this is the first example. I started with the dummy like gin and tonic. I compressed the compressed and cast it from n varchar to varchar. And I only get D. Okay. And the second one is even stranger. So I started with varchar and I was trying to cast the result as n varchar. When I run this, I will get something that looks like Chinese, but it's not Chinese. So as always, you must know your data and uh, your database design to be able to uh, get what you like. OK, let's see the performance. So these are the uh, original XML and the not original XML compressed. So when I was reading this table, I, you see that I first decompressed it and cast it to XML. I will turn on statistics and let's select. And when you look first at the execution plan, you will see, oh, nice, the second one, meaning the cast and the compress, was using only 35% of the whole batch. And the first one, oh, this is not good because it was using 66% of the whole batch. But actually, it's not so true because the first one was using only 63 milliseconds of CPU time. And the second one with the compress used uh, what 468 milliseconds. So it's not so efficient. Uh, why this 66% and 34% because of logical reads. So see, the compressed data <laughs> is using uh, uh, the non-compressed data is using more uh, storage space. So you actually have uh, more pages and more logical reads. So actually SQL Server thinks, oh, in the first query, I was using almost 20,000 logical reads. In the second one, I was using uh, almost 10,000 logical reads. And of course, the second query is better than the first one. But it's not totally true because you can see that the time was uh, much, much bigger in the second one. OK. And this is all about compress and decompress. Are there any questions about that? 
It looks quiet in the chat, so I don't think there are questions. OK. 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 Uh, create or alter. So it's introduced from SQL Server 2016. And my conclusion is so, yes, after many years, SQL Server introduced the possibility to create or alter an object depending of it's already exist or not. Currently supported uh, types by create or alter are store procedures, functions, triggers, views. And uh, yes, you can see here the example. So actually, if you try to create a store procedure, that already exists, you will get uh, error message. There is already an object name. So you could solve this by first check, and if check, you can drop it, for example, or something. And the new cool thing is that you can use create or alter procedure. So if the procedure already exists, it will be altered. If otherwise, it will be created. Similar is uh, drop if exist, Akadai. Uh, so it's also introduced to SQL Server 2016. And for example, you want to drop an object, for example, a table, and uh, like temp tables or some stored procedures some whatever. So now, of course, you have the drop if exist statement. It's a conditional drop statement. And of course, uh, still as before, you can run this only if you have adequate permissions. If the object exists and you don't have adequate permissions, you will get no error message. And the reason for that is that the drop if exists simply suppress the error message. Currently supported objects types by drop if exist are many of them tables, roles, triggers, views, types, databases, schemas, and etc. Okay, uh, date diff big. So, in short, uh, date diff is introduced, uh, date diff big is introduced in SQL Server 2016. Is the same function as date diff that it's here from 2008 SQL. And the only difference between these two is the big, the big part, you know, because the date diff returns int data type and date diff big returns big int data type. So <clears throat> actually, you can use it for uh, for much bigger uh, much bigger uh, differences in time. So, for example, if you see here uh, one day, one day, you know in microseconds what you were unable to use the the diff function because it is was uh, overflow, you get the overflow of the int value, and now you can use the date diff big, actually, and you can get not only microseconds, but even nanoseconds. And sometimes you could need this. Hash bytes, uh, in short words, hashing is a process of generating a value or values from a string or text using a mathematical function. SQL Server hash bytes was introduced in SQL Server in 2005, and it was supporting only MD2, MD4, MD5, SHA and SHA1 hashing algorithms. From SQL Server 2012, there were additionally introduced uh, SHA to uh, 256 and 512 algorithms. And prior to SQL Server 2016, 
the input value was limited to 8,000 bytes. And from C++ 2016, the limit does not exist anymore. And you can use the nvarchar var binary max input data. Uh, starting from C++ 2016, all algorithms are deprecated. They, of course, uh, continue to work, but only the last two are recommended for usage. Okay, let's see some <clears throat> maybe interesting demos. Ah, okay, yes, I have actually one really nice. So, okay, create of alter. Uh, let's not use. Okay, uh, I'm creating a procedure. Okay, that's nice because I did know actually that it doesn't exist. But when I try one more time to create it, now I get the old error. Okay, and this was the way to solve this. So actually, I'm checking if the object exists. If uh, yes, then I'm dropping it, dropping, <coughs> dropping it, and recreating. But now I have the creator alter, and I can run this as you see many, many, many times, and I will not get an error because uh, SQL Server checked for me and it is altering it. OK, uh, drop non-existing table. Let's try to drop it. OK, uh, so I get the error message. But I can, for example, also check if this object exists, is not null, then drop a table, blah, blah, blah. And the other way is to use uh, if exist. So drop if exist. And I can run this. I will not get an error message because the error message is suppressed. But thanks to the great Erland Somarskog, uh, I have a nice demo for you. So I will create uh, two tables, of course. I will uh, create a plain user and give him the rights to the official table, as you can see. I will now run this query as a plain user, of course. And I want to drop uh, the secret table is here, but the user has no rights for that, of course. There is official table that user has only select rights to this and no such table. So this table doesn't exist, of course. Uh, now I'm trying to run this. I get three error messages, of course. The first one because I don't have no rights to this table. The second one because I don't have the right to drop it. I can only select data from this table. And the third one, it doesn't exist. And now I'm thinking, oh, that's actually great because I can use my drop if exist. And I will not get error messages. I am right. Let's run it. Oh, something is wrong here. So actually, I get one error message. So it's not, a, not totally suppressed, the error messages. So I get the error for the official table. And as you can remember, the official table was granted some kind of right to this plain user. And the only right was to be able to select data. And this drop table, if exists, actually returned me the error. So <clears throat> because uh, I was able only to select values from this table, but I still I didn't get the error for the table I don't have rights at all and for the table that doesn't exist. OK. And drop all of this. OK, date time big. Uh, I think this is pretty simple because uh, here we are looking one day and 
you will not get microseconds, but when using this date time div big, you will get actually microseconds and nanoseconds. Hash bytes, uh, I will show you something about this. I think this is pretty clear, so you can hash a value and you will get a hash. It's simple, you can, you have multiple algorithms and as the algorithms are uh, more complex, the result value is bigger and bigger, of course. And from 2016, it's better that you use only the last two of them. Uh, maybe if you are programming and you know what is actually hashing, uh, you know that there is a salt value. The possibility actually when you hash the same value twice, you will get different hashes. In SQL Server, there is no salt value, so the results are uh, the same. So in SQL Server, you cannot, uh, you don't have the salt value. Uh, okay, and different data types will actually give you different results, as you can see here. So the n varchar uh, and not n uh, are giving different values. Uh, <clears throat> why actually I like to use this uh, hash hashing? Uh, for example, when you have a synchronization between two tables, only records that have changed, that are changed, then uh, I I am oft, oftenly used. Uh, I am calculating the hash based on XML or maybe also uh, JSON. So it's working in both uh, ways. So you can actually the whole record convert to JSON and just calculate the hash of this. And of, for, every, uh, for every column of the sales invoice and invoice line, you will know if the record has changed or not. So this is a great way for a synchronization between two databases, the same table, or maybe two tables in the same or different databases or whatever. So it's much uh, simpler to uh, to uh, see that if the hashes are different and you can calculate them with using, I don't know, triggers or whatever you like, and you can just uh, see if the hashes are the same, so meaning that the records are the same. Otherwise, maybe the records are changed. Okay. And uh, yes, this is the, the same explanation of this, just that may, maybe you can have an idea. So for example, you will see here that these two records are the same and these last two are the same. And so this is true because the record with ID one and five are John and the same born on and so on. So I first calculated the JSON of the whole row and then calculated the hash of this JSON. And uh, so it's, pretty good for comparement. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. I will uh, just finish with my uh, presentation. I just have two or three slides. And uh, so for now, <clears throat> currently these functions are supported only on Azure SQL, but I hope that they will be in the future available on on-premises new version of SQL. So greatest and least. Uh, actually, I are return data type with the highest precedence for the set of types passed to the function. 
if all arguments have the same data type and the type is supported for comparison, the function will return that type. Otherwise, uh, the function will implicitly convert all arguments to the data type with a higher precedence. And uh, greatest and least, uh, one more thing, all expression in the list of arguments must be of the data type that is comparable and that can be implicitly converted to the data type uh, of the argument with the highest precedence. Implicit conversion of all arguments to the highest precedence data type take place before the comparison. If implicit type conversion between the arguments is not supported, the function will fall and return an error. If one or more arguments are not null, then the null argument will be ignored during comparison. And if all arguments are null, then greatest will return null. The function types are not supported for comparison are uh, varchar max, var binary max, and n varchar max data types that uh, are 8000 bytes or below are supported and they will be implicitly converted. And so the greatest return the maximum value of a list of one or more expression while the least returns the minimum value for from a list of one or more expressions and okay uh, i am connected to azure database here so this is pretty simple you have the greatest, I have three parameters, and of course the greatest value is 1979. And for the string one is the example because it's uh, actually like you make sorting of, of three. And uh, okay, I have some more examples of that. So it's pretty simple, the case. I have three values and I want to get, uh, so the table has three columns. I want to get the greatest value of the, the other, of all three columns. So it's nice because you don't have to use the, for example, switch case or if, or something like that. So you can actually find the greatest value in, uh, only uh, one. Okay, so all the implicit conversion is done. So this is okay because I have actually two strings and one int. The int, as you know, has the highest precedence. So SQL Server tried actually to implicitly convert all strings to int and it succeeded. But for example, in this case, it will be not possible because here I have one float, but the SQL Server was thinking maybe this is a string or something and uh, started from string to, to float and float and int are not so easily converted between. And also here, for example, uh, the AA was uh, since the int has the highest precedence, SQL Server was not able to cast an int in the. So, uh, if one value is null, then it will be ignored. But if all values are null, the result will be null. And okay. So, this is not supported because uh, you can the value is actually exceeding 8,000 bytes. So it's only possible if it is uh, smaller. Okay, and the list actually is vice versa of the greatest. So I will not show you the same demos for that, but notice that with the greatest, I get 1,979 and now I get the free. Okay, and thank you very much.